Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to be virtual, uh, to be able to worship together all around Tifton and the surrounding counties and state and even in other states and other parts of the world as we know uh, families that have friends that are connected in with us to be able to join with us and to worship together. And so, Lord, we thank you for technology and for the opportunity to be able to do this. And, uh, Lord, we look forward to uh, next weekend being together. But, Lord, I know that you have a word for us today um, here virtually. And so I pray that you would speak to all of us as we uh, look to your word together today. And as we're excited about um, Christmas, we're excited about this time of the year. And we just want to be reminded of the significance of it as we uh, worship together now in your word and study together uh, for the few moments that we have. We thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say together. Amen. If you, hey, if you got anybody that is with you in the room, wherever you may be, go ahead and tell them Merry Christmas. If you haven't done that already, I mean, I know we're a few days away, but hey, you know, we're, we're almost there. Uh, so go ahead and tell somebody, you know, Merry Christmas. You know, man, excited about the upcoming, upcoming days and the, uh, and the weeks ahead. Uh, we are virtual. We kind of had to make a last minute announcement towards the end of the week. We kept waiting and we were looking at the parking lot and watching it and we began to realize it doesn't look like it may make it to get paved, and so it's going to be paved this coming week, probably Tuesday or Wednesday, hopefully, and so next Sunday, everything seems to be a go, and unless something crazy happens, we will be on campus next week, but just stay tuned on social media, but we really look forward to being all together next week, uh, the Sunday right before uh, Christmas, so uh, we will see you then, and hopefully the parking lot will be paved and everything else, and we'll be here on campus together, but uh, we are virtual as we continue in our series, Christmas 2020, that God has a word for you, right? And, and we're kind of going into week two of that uh, together this morning, and so as we go into week two of, of that message, um, what we want to look at is talking about God's greatest gift. Like he has a word for you and he has a gift for you that he's given for all of us to be able to receive. And so this is a time of year where we receive gifts. It's a time of year where we, we give gifts. In fact, normally if somebody asks you about this time, hey, have you already uh, bought all your, your Christmas gifts? Have you already been shopping? Most of the time, if someone asks you that question, it's because they've already done all of theirs. They've already completed it, and they're like, I'm, I'm finished. Hey, have you, done, have you finished completed? Have you completed? Have you got everything else you need to get? And so Christmas is a time you know, to exchange gifts. It can be a little crazy, you know, but it, but it is a time that we love being able to exchange gifts and with those that we love and our family and our friends and to be able to experience that together because Christmas is about God's gift to us. In fact, Christmas started with the giving of gifts. So look on the screen with me for just a moment. In Matthew chapter two and verses 11, it says, on coming to the house, they, talking about the wise men there, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And so they brought these gifts on, at the birth of Jesus to be able to, to, to present these gifts. And so the very first Christmas, right, with Christ being born, we find where presents were, uh, were presented. Now, obviously, you know, they, they don't seem to be wrapped. Scripture doesn't really say that they were wrapped. They opened up their treasures and presented them. You know, a couple of reasons we know they weren't wrapped, right? Uh, really two. One, because they were wise. And number two, because they were what? Men, right? <laughs> and thank God for uh, gift bags and, and, and having those to be able to help wrap our gifts during this time of the year. Uh, but when it comes to Christmas, it is about, you know, giving of gifts. But it's not as much about what we think oftentimes when we exchange gifts with our family and our, our loved ones. But the greatest part of Christmas is not the gifts, even in the first Christmas, it was not about the gifts that were brought to Jesus, but it was about the gift of Jesus being born which was much greater. It was more significant. And they were coming to worship him as he was born. They were coming to, to worship him and to see him. And, and in that, they, they brought gifts, but it was about the gift that they were going to receive, the, the biggest gift that you could possibly ever imagine. It's like when you're a kid, or if you watch kids, they'll go when there's Christmas presents under the tree. And what do they do? First, they'll go look, and they'll start looking at the labels, and what are they doing? They're looking for their name, right? And, and then after they look for their, their name, and then they'll start to, shake it and like check it out like I wonder I wonder what this is like 
Who's the big gift over there? What is that big box over there? And we begin to imagine what it could be. You know, the kids start wanting to guess what it might be. You know, they want to touch it. They want to shake it, see if it makes any, any type of noise uh, to try to describe what it might look like. In, in Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 9 and verse 15 there in that passage, it says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, that the gift that God gives us is indescribable. It's like trying to figure out what's in that box, but, but the gift that he provides, it's hard to even be able to describe it. The magnitude of the gift that is bigger than you could ever imagine. And so when you think about gifts, there's three different things that, that you do with gifts, especially around this time of the year, right? One is you uh, will, will give gifts. Number two, you may be on the other end and you receive gifts. But then number three is oftentimes, you know, at the end of Christmas, like in, in, in January, the, the, the day after Christmas or in January, oftentimes you'll find people going to the store to do what? To exchange gifts, right? Maybe the, the, the outfit didn't fit or, or, or maybe they already had one of those and so they're taking it back to get something different. And so we either give them, we receive them, or we find ourselves in a position of exchanging them. And, and what I want us to do is I really want us to focus for a few minutes this morning um, on what it looks like to exchange the gift uh, during Christmas. God was willing to exchange gifts with us um, in a way that you and I could never imagine, in the way that he wanted to exchange those gifts. And so in God's greatest gift exchange, right, with, with Christmas and what he provides for us, you know, he, what he takes is he takes things that we never wanted, right? Uh, he takes the worst in our lives, and he gives us what we could never imagine, which is the best for our lives. So he takes those things that are worse. He takes those things that are unwanted, and he exchanges it with the best that we could ever imagine, that, that, that brings about the best life that could ever happen. It's like this. It's like you walking into a place and you turning in an old Nintendo that's broken to pieces. It doesn't work, right? The wires don't work. You can't get it to, to work. It won't even turn on. And you go in and, and turn in and exchange an old Nintendo, the, the old school, that doesn't even work. And you walk out with a PS5. Now, some of you parents are like, there's not even, there's, they don't exist, right? There's, I'm not spending $1,000 on eBay for someone who's bought them up and reselling them because of supply and demand, right? But, but it's like walking in with an old Nintendo and, and coming out with a PS5, you're like, that doesn't happen. Like, how could that happen? There's only one way it could happen. If you knew the owner and the owner loved you and he wanted to gift you, that's the only way that would happen. And God loves you. And God wants to gift you with a gift, the greatest gift. And when he gifts us, what we have to realize is he brings this ability to be able to exchange. And so there's, there's many different gifts that we could talk about and that we bring to exchange with Jesus to, to exchange it for a better gift. But I just want to give you a, a couple this morning that you'll find on the screen as we go through this very quickly. I'm only going to give you five, and we won't be together too long this morning. You'll get time to spend with your family. But I really want to, to get these down. I want you to see the magnitude of this. The first one, we exchange with, with God. We exchange our worry for God's gift of peace. Like he takes our worry, and in return, he's willing to give us peace. Now, we all worry, Um whether we want to admit, admit it or, or accept that or not, listen, we all do. We all worry in different ways. Some of us worry more loudly. Some of us worry more quietly, especially around this time with Christmas and, and the craziness and trying to, to do everything that we need to do. You know, we're, we're worrying about getting everything done that we need to get, buy everything we need to buy, be able to afford everything that we're trying to buy, and all of those things. Listen, we all, we all worry with the busyness that comes along. And so what do we do? What do we do with that worry? What, how, how do I exchange that worry, you know, for, for peace? Because you're like, hey, I'll try to stop worrying, but then I'm going to worry about trying to stop worrying. I'm going to worry that I can't stop worrying. And, and so, so how do I handle that? First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about what happens to you. So you give him 
your worry. You give him your cares, the things that you're, you're, you're concerned about. You say, God, here they are. I'm handing them over to you, Lord, because I, 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 can't, I can't keep worrying. Lord, I, I, I need peace in my life. And so, Lord, I give you this. You know what worry is? Worry is trying to control something that's, that you can't control, that, that's uh, incontrollable. I, I can't control my future. I can work towards it, but I can't control it. I can't control you. I can't control everything around me, the people around me. You can't control everyone around you. You may try, but you can't. It's not your job, right? You can't control your, your circumstances, things that happen. You know, worry is when we try to control things that are incontrollable. You know, so we have to be willing to, to give all of our worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares about what happens. One definition of worry is this. Worry is trying to do what only God can do. Worrying is when you begin to try to do things in your life that only God can do. And so what do we do? We have to cast our cares. We have to give those things to him. Listen, if he cares about the birds and he, and he takes care of the, the, the flowers in the field, Surely he wants to take care of you, and God cares about you. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 27, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. Like the peace the world gives like falls apart, and you know, it's, it's, it one minute it's up and one minute it's down. He says not, it's not fragile like the peace the world gives, so don't be troubled or afraid. He says, I, I want to give you that peace. So you, you give me that worry. I, I want to exchange that with you, cast it on me, and let me control the things that I'm supposed to control. Let, let me handle that. And, and, and you don't worry about it. I want to give you the peace that you need. And, and so you have to be willing to, to take heart and know that, that he's in control of those things. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, it says, I've told you this so that you may have peace in me here on earth, he says this, he says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Let me ask you a question. Who do you know that needs to take heart? Who do you know this Christmas season that's worried about a lot of things? Who do you know right now that's struggling? Who do you know that, that needs to hear that this Christmas? Hey, you need to take heart. God knows all about it. And you need to cast it on him because he cares about what happens to you. So maybe this Christmas, you take time to, to, to message somebody. In, in fact, right now, let's do this. Right now, pull out your phone, unless you're driving. If you're driving, you shouldn't even be looking at the screen. You're looking ahead. But if you're, if you're in your living room, if you're you know, sitting in the bed listening, if, if you're you know, in the kitchen drinking coffee, whatever it may be, or listening to this in the afternoon, right now, while we're doing this, let's do this live. So I want you to take your phone out, and I want you to think about somebody who you're already thinking about that, that needs to hear that. And here's what I want you to do. Just message them this. I'm thinking about you, and I'm praying for you. I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. I was thinking about you, and I'm, and I'm praying for you. Somebody that you know that's worrying. Somebody you know that needs to take heart. Somebody you know who's struggling. Why don't you do that right now while we're here? Take your phone and just send a simple max text and message and let them know, hey, I'm thinking about you, and I'm praying for you. Right, right now, we're all doing this together. And may that start a conversation. Thinking about you. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. Let me give you another thing that we exchange gifts. Not just our, our, our worry, but we can exchange our um, hurt for God's healing. That, that you and I can exchange the things in our life that, that, have, have, that have hurt us, that that we have faced and, and, and that it can bring, God can exchange that. He says, I'll take your hurt and, and I'll bring healing in your, in your life. And I've learned this, you know, through time and experience, everybody's hurting. At some point or another, you know, throughout your week, there's times where you're hurting, right? In, in many different ways. You know, in, in the room that you're sitting in right now with others, there's people hurting. You know, in, in the connections you have with those around you, there's people that, that are hurting, 
you know, there's emotional hurt, there's, there's spiritual hurt, there's physical hurt, there's, there's financial hurt. Everybody's hurting at some point in their life and, and, and throughout the weeks that they go through, uh, we, we struggle with those things. And God says, hey, I'll take that hurt and I'll bring healing. Psalms 143 verse 3 says this, he heals the brokenhearted. And what does he do with their wounds? This is interesting here. He says, what does he do? He says, I bind up their wounds. This is how God does it. He says, you know, I'll, I'll heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. If I break my arm, if I, if I break a bone in my body, if I break my arm, what happens? I have to go, and they put it in a cast, and what do they do? They're going to bind it up so it can take time to heal, right? It's, it's, they're going to bind it up, and, and once, it's, once it's in that um, position, and then what? It takes time to heal. Hurt takes time to heal. It's not instant. It's not that they fix the broken bone and then I'm perfect again, right? It's, it's no, it, it takes time for the body to be able to, to reheal. And so God binds up the wounds in, in, in places in your heart and in, in, in your life and things that you're going through. He, he says, hey, let me bind that up. Let me bring healing. It's going to take time, but with kindness and his grace and his forgiveness and his presence, he's able to, to, to bring healing in those things. And so oftentimes when we talk to people that are, that are struggling with hurt, we're like, hey, well, here's something. How about read, read Psalms? You know, take, take time to read through Psalms for some encouragements, for some therapy, for the, for the hurt that you have. You know, if you're, going through, if you're going through any hurt, hey, here's something that you can read. And, and, and then they go through and they read in Psalms 23 verses like this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to the still waters. And what does he do? He restores my soul. He brings healing with time. He, he brings healing into your life and, and into my life. And he'll take that hurt and he'll bring healing. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, it says this in the message paraphrase. It says, he, God, comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us along someone else who is going to go through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. That, he, that he'll be there the way that he was there for us, that you and I can in return be there for other people. So God puts people in our lives that we're able to help along the way, and he actually calls us to help bring healing for other people in the same way that he's brought healing, that to help them along the way the same way that he has helped us. And so God uses that in our lives in the way that he works. The next one is this. He also, we're able to exchange this with him. We exchange our grief for God's joy. We give God our grief, and when you and I give God our grief, he will exchange it with joy. Now, you say, how, how does this work? Well, first, let's talk just for a moment about what grief is. The only way not to grieve in this world is not to love. It's the only way. To not grieve is to not love, because in this world, we don't last forever. And in fact, if you're sitting by somebody right now, look at them and say, you're not going to last forever. They're not. And in this world, we're not going to last forever. You know, things that are in our life are not going to last forever. You know, people don't last forever. Things don't last forever. And eventually, if you love something, eventually, you'll lose it. Eventually, it'll be gone. Whether it's a loved one who passes from this earth, whether it's something that, that you love that's no longer there, what, whatever it may be, the only way not to grieve is, is to not love. And we've always said this before, but anytime we're, we come around the time of Christmas season, Christmas will always turn up the volume for whatever's going on in your life, right? So if things are going really good, then Christmas really amplifies that goodness in, in your life. It turns the volume up. But if things are going difficult, if there's grieving, if, if there's you know, things that are happening that are not good, Christmas will also amplify that, and it'll turn that up in your life. And the only way to deal with grief is to give it to God because only God is greater than grief. We have to give it to the one who's greater than it, and we have to be willing to give it to God. 
In John chapter 16, in verse 20, Jesus said this, You will grieve, but your grief will turn to what? There's that word. We're going to grieve. Like, it's going to happen. We live in this broken world. And he says, you will grieve, right? But your grief will turn to joy. We give him our grief and he gives us joy. You're like, what kind of deal is that? How, how does he even make that happen? How would he give joy in the midst of my, in my grief? Like, how, how does that exchange happen? How, how does that take place? Have you ever experienced this? For some of you that are older, um, you, you may have more experience with this than some that are younger. But I know some of you have experienced that memories of somebody that you loved can become sweeter over the years after you've lost them right? The memories that you have become sweeter as years pass by from the time that you've lost them. But this is something that's much greater than that, far greater than what you or I thinking of when we think about the memories we have of those that, that have, have gone on. Um, he gives us joy when we begin to realize that this world is not all there is. He brings us joy when we begin to realize that I really haven't lost that thing that I thought I lost. That person that I loved. That as a Christ follower, I'll see that person again in heaven. That, that, that this is not the end. My grief begins to turn to joy. Realizing that, that the things in this world will pass away. But God uses my circumstances. God uses those trials. God uses those storms. God uses those difficult times um, to bring about part of his purpose. And he uses even the ones that we bring on ourselves. And God uses all of that. And, and, and he turns all of that for, he says, he works all of those things out for his good. So we can trust in him knowing that he's working all of those things out. And when, and when I begin to realize that this world is not all there is, but, but there's eternity, there's the hereafter, there's heaven that we look forward to, that I put my hope less in this world and more in eternity and more in Christ, the more joy I begin to have. But the problem is this, when you begin to hang all of your hope on this world, you're going to find yourself living in this, this roller coaster of ups and downs because it's based on the circumstances of this world. But when you realize that there's far more than just what's here and it's eternity, it begins to set our eyes in a different position. And even though we may go through difficult times, we can still have joy. And he says, you're going to grieve, but I can turn that grief into joy when we begin to realize there's so much more. Luke chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 10 and, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 says, The angel said to him, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Like that, He's our Savior. We looked at this verse last week. He's the Savior. He's the gift. He's the one who brings all of those things, and, and it can help us to have joy, that we can surrender those things and exchange them with him, and he brings about that in our life. And he said, How do we work with other people? How do we, how do we go through? through that together. Well, in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. Like we walk along that journey with them because we do live in a broken world. But our hope is found in Jesus, the greatest gift ever. Very quickly, I'm going to give you two back to back right here. Another one is we exchange our fears for God's love, that we take our fear and we can exchange it for the love that God has for us. Now listen, I know 2020 has been a, a, a year for the books, right? I mean, so many things have gone on this year. The chaos with politics. We've seen more you know, with, with prejudice and, and with, with people's actions and things that they've been a part of. And the hatred. Even the natural disasters and all, all of the things that have happened with COVID-19, I mean, even this Christmas is a little different perhaps and who you're able to see, you know, family that you perhaps haven't seen since March because they have compromised immune systems. And, and so listen, 2020 has been a difficult year. And there's a lot of people with a lot of fear and a lot of concerns. And he says, hey, you can, you can exchange those fear, those fears you have for God's love. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, With his love, he will calm all of your what? Your fears. With God's love, he'll calm the fears in your life. He will exchange the fear that you have, and he'll bring about love in your life. 
1 John chapter 4, verse 18 tells us why God's love is so powerful and that it calms all, all our fears, right? It tells us there is no fear in love, but perfect love, what, drives out fear. When God's love comes in, fear is driven out, right? Why? Because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made in, in perfect love. Fear has to do with punishment. We begin to look and say, well, maybe I deserve this. Maybe God's out to get me. Maybe God's coming after me, and he's wanting to hurt me. But if you think that God's out to get you because of the wrong things that you've done, then you do not understand the Bible at all. Not at all. You have to realize that it's, it's, you've got it wrong if you think that God's out to get you. God's not out to get you based on the, 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 the wrong that you've done. In fact, he, he's come and he's pursuing you. It's the opposite of that. He has good intentions towards you, right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Have everlasting life. And you, my friend, are part of the whosoever. I'm part of the whosoever. This world's the whosoever. Every one of us has an opportunity to accept salvation, to accept that gift that he provides. And he is working in the exact opposite way that you may have thought that he was working. He's actually working to provide the best life ever for you, not to harm you, but to, to, to save you from harm, right? To save you from the things of this world. For he so loved the world. And that, that's the hope that we have. And then not only worry to peace, hurt to healing or, or grief to joy or even fear to love, but this last one and I'm done. We exchange our sin for God's forgiveness. We give him our very worst, right? All of the ugly in our, of our sins and, and he gives us forgiveness. He, he gives us a clean heart. Right? He, he gives us a new start. He gives us the best life that you and I could possibly live. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 on the screen, look at this. It says, when people sin, they earn what sin pays. What is that? It says there, death. But God gives us a free gift, life forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so here's what that means. Um, sin promises so much. It does. Sin promises, hey, this will be exciting. This will be great. Um, I, 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 and I'll help, I'll help get you ahead. This will, this will help you. But in the end, the payoff for sin is always the same, regardless of the sin. The payoff of sin is death. Is, is, is death, it's separation from God. The payoff for our sin is death. And Jesus says, hey, instead of that payoff, in, instead, of, instead of that, I want to give you a free gift. I, I want you to take this gift, and this gift is this, is I want to pay off that debt of your sin. I want to pay off the debt of all of those mistakes you've made. I want to pay off the debt of all that junk that's, that's in your life. I'm going to die on the cross so that I can offer you the free gift of, of my forgiveness. That's what I'm willing to do. It's the greatest gift. They came bringing gifts, but really they were there to, to watch the gift grow of, of who Jesus would be, God in the flesh, what he would do. He would take on the sin of this world and provide forgiveness. He would be willing to exchange your sin for forgiveness. And that's the gift that that he offers every one of us. And so if you've never accepted that gift, wherever you are right now, it's the greatest gift of Christmas. And I would encourage you to accept it right now. Maybe you really don't know. You're like, I don't know if I really have or not. Then, then I would encourage you to accept it right now. The greatest gift that you could ever receive. The forgiveness of your sins. And it simply comes by you being willing to say, you know, Jesus, I accept the gift of forgiveness. You know, I accept your gift of new life. You know, I, I, I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes and I want to repent of my sins and I want to confess you as Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for rescuing me. It's a very simple prayer, but it changes everything. 
when you're willing to, to bring the exchange and give it to him. And then once you receive that gift, well, it's our responsibility to do what? To tell others. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ offering peace and forgiveness to the people of this world. And he has given us the work of sharing his message about peace. And so we're to share the message of Christ with the world, to spread the good news to the world. So my challenge to you is this. How about you message somebody encourage them this week? Maybe tell someone of the decision you've made today. If you've given your life to Christ, you need to tell somebody what's happened. You, you need to share that with others. You need to let us know so we can rejoice with you and help you on that journey. There's a place on our website you can do that. You can come next weekend and come find me and say, hey, Pastor BJ, I gave my life to Christ. Or, or tell one of our, our team members, tell somebody, hey, this is the decision that I, 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 I made and I want to take those next steps. So you do that. But hey, how about this also? Between now and next weekend, how about you invite somebody next weekend to come back? It's been two weeks since we've seen you guys. So we're, we're dying to see you. Like We're excited to be back on campus next weekend. Two weeks away. How about you invite somebody with you? It's the Sunday before Christmas, and we're going to have the Christmas story. Why don't you invite somebody to come be a part of that and join and in, in, in worship with us? I want to pray for you. We're going to celebrate with one more song, sing a song out, and then you guys will spend the rest of the day with your family. Take time to invite, invite someone next weekend. Take time to encourage someone. Take time to evaluate what are some things I need to exchange that God can give me something better. Father, we thank you for um, this time together this morning. Father, I thank you for, uh, again, for the opportunity for people to join in wherever they may be. And, and Lord, for people that may have given their life to you this morning, that, that have surrendered their life to you, that have repented their sins, Father, I pray that you would give them the courage to take the next steps that they need to take in the journey um, that, that you've given them. Uh, Father, I pray that we as a church would continue to live on purpose and mission that you've called us to live with. Lord, help us to be reminded of all of your your goodness and who you are. And Lord, we celebrate that you bring the greatest gift of all. And so Lord, may we, may we truly hand those things over. May we truly exchange those things that we need to exchange that you can give us something better as we surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, again, thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next weekend. Let's sing one more song together before we're dismissed.